Yo, what's going on, E7 fam? Pat here, back with another video. And in this one, we're going to take a look back on the season that was the O season in World Arena, in which I finished Emperor yet again. So this is like my, what, eighth time being crab gaming? And y'all really seem to love it when I go over my account and talk about what the season was like and the lessons that I learned from it. So once again, we're going to do that here in this video. But first, before we get into it, Leave a like if you do enjoy this style of content or consider subscribing. It really does help me out a ton. It costs you nothing. Only about a third of the people that watch my videos are actually subscribed. And I'm very, very close to the 10,000 subscriber milestone. I do intend to give, do a giveaway when that actually happens. And if nothing else, just comment down below to appease the algorithm god. Speaking of down below, video is going to be very long. Use the timestamps to jump to any part of the video that you actually want to see. Any of my characters, you can kind of just jump ahead and see that. But first, let's talk about the lessons learned from the Oath season. So this season for me was the most fun that I've had in like almost a year. And that's going to come in stark contrast to some of the things I'm going to say in this season, right? So let's talk about how I feel about the state of Epic 7 before I get into why I still thought it was kind of fun, right? Because this is going to... We'll, we'll give you the bad news first, right? The O season highlighted to me simply how bad the current state of Epic 7 is. You can't play anything really fun in, like, champion or higher rating. At least not unless you have, like, like Leviathan whale level gear, right? You just can't play it. And you can't really climb in this game... Unless you have a deep hero roster that is chock full of limited units and specific Moonlight 5 stars. When you take a look at my roster in a minute, you're going to realize that most of my characters are ones that people who just started playing from the Overlord Club aren't going to have access to because their account is too new. Or it's a Moonlight 5 star that you know you have to get lucky or spend a lot of money to get. And that feels really, really bad. Especially because a lot of people did come into the game with the Overlord Club. I don't want them to feel that way. And I think that this is a problem that we'll need addressing very, very soon. Many of the game's best units right now also have very little to no counterplay. They are what I like to call get paid units. Essentially, they are characters that don't need carefully crafted plans or specific teams to set up. Think of a character like Fumir. That's not a get paid unit. That is intentionally crafted in such a way that you get a reward for being um, smart with your decisions and your picks, right? A lot of the best units in the game, like Death Dealer Ray or C Phantom Politis, are get paid units. They just press a button, unload their entire kit, and you get so much advantage off of it that your win is nearly guaranteed. And in the case of a hero like Navy Captain Landy, you might not even need to press buttons. Your opponent just presses buttons and somehow you get paid. Like, these style of units are just really frustrating and unfun to play against. They make the game super unenjoyable. Now, as I said at the start, though, it's not all doom and gloom. I did find this season very fun. And I think the reason why I found this season really fun is because of my audience, those of you who watch me. I streamed more games this season than I did in the past, and I think that I had a blast doing it because you all made it that way, right? We played really stupid things together on stream, right? We tried to stall people out with Ein Zul going when he came out, right? And that was really, really fun. I got to Luna Cleave a couple of people. Like, people would basically donate to me to get me to try to kill people with Luna or force me to try to cleave, you know, like it, when I, it's not my comfort zone, just, just to do it. Cause it's funny. Right. And that was, I had a blast doing that. I got a lot of laughs out of doing that stuff. We got to explore Albedo together when she came out and I even made a video on her and people seemed to think she was really mid. So I went and did some propaganda style streams to try to promote her to let you know, I think she's really good. And those streams didn't exactly pan out really well, but I had super fun with them. And I also, in those streams, learned a lot about the character. And it let me progress her to, I think, as her final form. I think I've settled on where I want to be with this character. And I think she's ridiculous. And we will talk about her in a little bit. Now, in addition to all the streams, right? 
I got to hang out on Discord with you guys a lot after various different streams just during the week. We got to talk strategy through either the chat channels, uh, the DMs. You know, I would give you guys advice on your drafts. You guys would give me feedback on things that you're seeing. And it really felt like I was having fun and I had like a little community that I'm actually like interacting with. And I, I love all the people in it. It's amazing. It's a great feeling. I got messages like this one that I'm going to put up on screen from a longtime viewer, Machi, right? When I see this, it fills me, it fills my heart with so much joy. When I see your reactions, it's so much fun. So thank you guys. Thank you all so much. You made this season worth it. You guys make making Epic 7 content worth it, right? But yeah, that's the high point. Going back to the low point, as I was saying, the game's balance um, is pretty atrocious. And I'll be honest, there's a very real chance that if it doesn't improve, um, I might not even try next season of World War II. I might just get the skin and call it quits. Um, C Phantom Politis right now is nearly unbeatable outside of two or three solutions. So I'm going to throw up on your screen here. Gomiomi's draft, right? This was my captain during the content creator battle. He is commonly referred to as Korean Jesus or KJ for short. This is his draft that he played when going for legend this season. With his pre-bands, which by the way are Zeo and Red Politis, the only outs to this style of draft are be faster than him or have some kind of quirky tech like Shuna on Soul Constellation. And if you only have one quirky tech, he just bans it. So yeah, kind of hard to outspeed a 310 unit, by the way, in case you didn't notice, especially when they have a 14 speed imprint. Most people cannot contest that. And if he's playing it with like a mage, like you see like Rowana here and he soul burns it, there is zero counterplay to the draft. You just die. How is that fair? And now you might be thinking, well, okay, so he did this in Legend. How successful was it? He was number one in Hall of Fame. The best player in the world this season for the O season. Because there's no counterplay other than just pre-banning it. No consistent counterplay than just pre-ban the character. And even then, he has contingencies with Conqueror Loya. So it just doesn't feel fun or fair. We have made a situation where the speedster characters like Flitica, especially with the advent of Sid coming out, Flitica with like Sid or C Phantom Politis plus Conqueror Loyce plus a draft like this, there's not really that much counterplay at all. Right? Now, on the flip side, if you live in Slowville like me, it's incredibly difficult to tank down because characters like Gala or Janua just obliterate most of the characters in the game in one hit. There are a few tanks that are usable into these characters. But otherwise, most of the tanks of the game are pretty awful. And the thing is, the tanks that actually survive Gala, like that reduce enough damage that you can live through Gala and play a game against them. If your opponent is on a standard comp with Gala and you were on a standard comp with one of these tanks, what ends up happening is the game takes forever. I am somebody who enjoys playing slow. But when my games are averaging 10 to 12 minutes, like I have to basically choose a draft that lets me stay in the game for 10 plus minutes to have a shot of winning. That is not fun for me. And I'm sure it's not fun for the people I'm playing against. And it's probably not super interesting for the people that are watching me on YouTube or Twitch. So we're in this situation where there's just simply too much damage, right? Too much insta-win stuff in the game. And there's very little to stop it. And the things that do stop it and allow the game to actually breathe make the game super slow. It is a re it, that's how I know right now the game is in a really bad design spot because there is no middle ground where it's just like five to six minute games. It's all one to two minute blowouts or 10 plus minute slogs. And that is just awful. Now, I'm going to try to be a bit optimistic because I do think that the most recent round of changes that are coming with the balance adjustment are very good. Red Robbie and Blood Moon Haze look like they will shake a lot of things up. There's a lot of good stuff in that patch. Selene, for example, right? And there's a whole hell of a lot of units that I'll talk about in this review that 
also probably need nerfs and hopefully maybe one day we'll get those things right like i i think a lot of these characters do need honest to goodness nerfs but like we're moving in a good direction i just wish we were moving even further in that direction right now because as this game progresses with the state of the policy of i should say of no nerfs we're gonna hit a ceiling and what i mean by that is when i designed for card games we hit a ceiling at, at a point where games were just over in one turn and there was very little, if anything, that could be done about it. Like, you just had to get lucky with your opening hand. It became essentially modern Yu-Gi-Oh. If you didn't have the hand trap in your hand or the floodgate in your hand um, and your opponent had the stones, you just lost on turn one. You didn't get to play the game, right? And I, I think that those kinds of experiences aren't games. They are solitaire. They are essentially solved games. Skill no longer matters in the game. And that's really upsetting, right? We're not there yet, but I feel like we are very close to it with the state of how things are. Like, you just, your opponent, again, presses their get paid unit and they just run you over. And you can't really run a game, I feel like, with this level of balance in this state on a policy of upholding no nerfs. You're going to have to change something eventually. And at this point, like, if you're not going to do something about some of these characters, either introduce a lot of really well thought out and designed counter options with what we have already in the pool. If you're not going to nerf things, then honestly, it just leaves me feeling like this game, the esports dream for Epic 7 is a farce and only the biggest spenders can compete. And it becomes a game that, only really includes those people who are big spenders. And a game that only ha is competitive for big spenders loses the vast majority of its audience very quickly. And when you lose the vast majority of your audience, the whales leave. And when the whales leave, well then, it's no longer a game. Anyways, that's just my honest two cents on what I currently see with the design and balance of this game. Anyways. On with the rest of the review. So here you can see is all of the cool stuff that we got here. I will uh, turn up the sound a little bit so you guys can see it here on the side. So yeah, here is our, our cool Briar Witch skin. So if you wanted to see this, if you were unfortunate enough to not get the skin. Did I hold you up too long? Let me see this. No, the witch is you. The witch is you. Okay. That's an interesting line. Stay alert. No matter the foe. Alright. You will all disappear from my sight. Okay, the voice lines are, are alright. Did the witch send you? Yeah. I, I'm not personally like super big on this skin. I think it's just largely because Briar Witch's base skin is so incredible. All right? Alright. Enough of the skin and the rewards. Uh, by the way, I should back up real fast because we didn't talk about it. I, I forgot to show it, but change frame here. So you can see this is the... Where's our new frame? Here's our new frame here, right? Uh, we'll wear it for the video. That's fine. Yeah, so this is OC's in Emperor League. Ooh. Anyways. On with the actual account review for realsies this time. All right, let's talk about characters. Take a, a drink, because it's going to be a long one, as usual. Buckle in, boys and girls. Edward Elric. So Edward Elric, actually, he started to become pretty bad in the last like season or two. And he has started to make a small resurgence in the current metagame. My build is a little bit different than the last time you saw it. I think it's less tanky with a bit more damage. Um, injury is still here because there are a lot of Lia pickers on ladder, so I still needed to have some kind of out to Lia versus debuff comps. Still good at checking things like Briar Witch. Uh, Ambitious Tywin is very prevalent, so you need some way to kind of like, you know, ha you have to have some kind of damage dealer that could crack out of uh, the stun defense break combo. Edward's not the best one, but he's like at least decent there. But there are a lot of drafts, like especially in Cleave, a lot of new age Cleave characters, like the people play like Blooming, Lydica and stuff, uh, Ran, Zeo, Red Paul just makes a huge resurgence. 
these kinds of characters can't really be Edward Elric, so he became uh, not only like a decent answer to some of the Lyra comps that are playing heavy debuffs, but he's also pretty good, again, into Anticleave. He still feels like a scam unit a lot of the time, but he's still an important character to have, right? And once again, I feel bad for new players because Edward Elric hasn't had a rerun since August of 2022. So if FMA doesn't come back, this is just a very critical uh, tool in your kit that you're just never going to have access to. All right. Next up, we have Red Lilius. Uh, I only played Red Lilius in matches where my opponent banned Laia, took Laia, and took Lua. Basically, if they tried to... Like, Laia is the silver bullet to Lua. It's the reason why Lua is not really played much anymore. It's because Laia is a little every, every game unit because she just does everything. She's just honestly a, a pretty broken unit. Uh, so having a Lilius in the wings, like... You know, ignore my non-reforge here, right? But, like, I, I played her, like, once or twice. It's only into Lua when they have Lyra or Lyra's pre -band. There's no other reason for me to pick this character. Uh, Winter. Winter is just here as, like, a backup to punish Death Dealer Ray comps. Like, if they are basically all in on Death Dealer Ray and have no damage, they're probably looking to ban my Dragon King Sharoon. So I wanted to have another character that punishes them really hard. It's the only time I pick Winter. I don't really pick her in any other scenario. Uh, Genoa, aka Jamal, Jaden, Joshua, whatever you want to call him, Joseph. Um, mine is just very whatever. You'll notice that mine's on Grace of Growth. Uh, and that's because I wasn't confident that I wanted to hard commit to this character and let him be uh, viable and open for most of my games. Um, and that's why I didn't give the Mala to him because I'm, I'm pretty, you know, pretty low on Mala uh, overall. As you can see, I only have 12 to my name. So, like, I'm not, like, in the best shape Mulligora-wise. But I recognize the character is broken, OP, stupidly powerful, need to have access to him. So I decided to have him geared in case I decided I got frustrated of uh, another character and took him off pre -band, Which did happen a couple of times. I won most of the games that I had him. Because he really is that broken, even without his uh, S1, <clears throat> excuse me, fully maxed out. But overall, this character is just uh, another... Like, it's another design mistake because he just blows up. He's designed to blow up your Abyssals and your your Landies because they're they're so hard to kill. But what ends up happening in reality is that he just kills everything. Like, he one-taps, like, everything in the game. So when games with him involved just basically devolve into games where you're just on, like, three or four blue units versus him and just praying that you get the... The 50-50 miss from the elemental disadvantage. That's terrible design, right? Like, if the counter is just stack all of one color and pray, that's awful. That's absolutely atrociously bad game design. Um, and then the rest of the, like, counterplay to him is just baiting his, his uh, S2 and then trying to stun him, which, you know, some of the best players in the world, they play this character on, like, 180 to 210 ER. So, like, your ROL baits don't work on those ones, and they still kill you in one hit, so... Where's the counterplay? I, I don't know. This character is just a mistake. Uh, Charon, I've only played him, like, two games the whole season. He's just anti cleave He's just on some spare gear. This is the same Charon that's been here for probably, like, all of my account reviews. He doesn't change. Uh, I just keep him geared because it's not really high-quality gear, and he doesn't really need much. Like, you just... Oh, he's on counter set and immunity. Uh, I don't think they have any way to strip my Charon. I'm just going to slam him and just pray. And it works out. Like, he's not my favorite anti cleave, but you never know. Sometimes it works. Uh, Bihu. Bihu's really important versus Gala, right? And also really important versus ML Shu because these are characters that they are relying on a specific buff to stay in the game or to stay relevant in a game. And Bihu just says, no, you can't have those things. And that's really, really important. He does big damage also against a character like Navy Captain Landy. You get rid of all the critical hit resistance. Uh, and then you can just burn Landy out of the game because you don't have to worry about our critical hit resistance. He's a DPS that just ignores crit. That's why he's pretty good. Mine is built with not as much defense as I'd like it. It's got more HP, less defense than I would like. I would honestly think I would bump up my defense a bit more. My attack is pretty good. I feel like my defense and my effectiveness is also pretty good, but it's not the best effectiveness, right? Because some people will play like ER 
Galilius, which is one of the things he's meant to counter. And they'll back it up with like either a Christie or like a Bastion of Perlucia tank. And then it becomes my Bihu pick feels really invalidated. I had very mixed success with this character. I do think this character is very, very good. I just think that maybe the way that I'm deploying him and the way I have him built might not exactly be the best, right? As for the exclusive equipment, it is the one that burns all enemies uh, using Symphony of Radiance. I originally thought it was the attack buff would be the best because it gives us max damage burns, which is really, really good. Um, and after talking to my friend Inori, he kind of explained to me that you're almost never drafting somebody without attack buff like you you usually have attack buff on your team and in that case the ee is redundant right and even if you aren't getting the upfront damage on the burn can sometimes be the difference between winning and losing a game because like gala's got to go quickly so putting the burn down uh and the unbuffable means that she's going to get chunked for a huge amount of damage and then you can just have somebody immediately go and pick her off right after she takes her turn while she's still really low on health so that is very, very good. Um, and it made me realize that, you know what? Maybe he's right. And I had a bit more success with Bihu since I switched to that uh, EE. Uh, here's my slowest dirt. Nequal on purples and a blue boot. The legendary blue boot that has made uh, a resurgence in a lot of these videos. Because uh, it's like 29 effectiveness, which is not amazing, but it's not terrible. Um, even for somebody like me who is slow, you need Nequal. Because this character is a massive massive mess up on the design team i said it when she came out right that i think she was one of the most poorly designed characters ever and she was a massive mistake nicole in the spots where she is good in the third to fourth pick slot against certain players in certain compositions says ban me or you do not get to play the game she is contributing to games taking very long and being very unfun most games involving the qual are literally your opponent conceding immediately once a lock is in place or you spending upwards of 10 minutes saying that letting it to make it so they can never catch a button uh, press a button your silence your pushback your passive skills don't work you can't counter right and then she's just zipping around and taking all the turns from the speed bomb this character is super super oppressive probably one of the best characters in the whole game maybe like i would say she's like top three right because in the spots where Nakwal is good, nothing your opponent does matters. Literally nothing. You know why? Because they can't do anything. This character is actually just like... I'm just frustrated. There's a reason why this character was pre-banned for most of the season. I'm surprised at how infrequently this character is picked. Um, again, shoutouts to Anori. Anori was showing me in the last couple of days how to deploy Nakwal from my playstyle. And I was drafting her in the, th the third, fourth slot a lot. And I was just locking people out of the game. I don't even have a good Nikwal. Imagine if I was Red. Red has a Nikwal with more effectiveness than me. And 23 more speed, 24 more speed than me. Right? He's got like a three, 305 Nikwal or something. How is anyone supposed to play the game against that? This character is just not okay. Milam. Um, this is the same Milam you probably have all seen from previous videos. I think there might be a couple of stat changes. I, I still keep her geared. I very rarely take her. But, again, you know, you never know. Sometimes Greenlandy rears her head as she does. She's kind of like an evergreen unit. I don't really ever expect Greenlandy to truly fall off. There will always be a Landy picker here or there. And for those times, that's when I have Milam, right? Um, that's kind of just my standard bruiser Milam. Just be really tanky, hard to kill. Um, I think I played her two to three games this season. I won all of them. So, it is what it is. Uh, Dragon Dive amount increased by uh, health increased by 20%. In case you're wondering what EE, because I am on a plus 30 Dragon Knuckles. So, I have the most amount of chances to counter with my Mila. Politis. Uh, shout outs to Valky for the build. Uh, yeah, this is one of the most reliable ways in the game to deal with Sea Phantom Politis because you have enough ER where they're basically playing very greedy with their stats. They're all in on speed with maybe only 70 to 100 effectiveness. So this gives you a chance to not get resisted and overtake their team with Politis between the combination of the ER and the speed. 
and get two chances to proc Abyssal. And the unbuffable, which makes the Sea Phantom Paul just vulnerable, so you can one tap her before she takes a second turn and you get they get no value out of the character, right? So that's the logic for what the Paladus is. It's one of the only reliable ways to see Phantom Paladus. The thing is that people will they have developed like anti-tech to it where it's just like because already ambitious tywin is good versus this and they already want to take that anyway and then they could just take like lionheart sermia and you're just in a really bad like feels bad position so like you can't take paul to super early you'll get punished but then that lets leaves them open to taking paul so it's like this really weird mind game that you're still not advantaged uh over especially because now enough time has passed with c phantom paulus that people are aware red paulus is the answer so they will try really hard to just keep you off the red Paladus. If like this is your only answer to see Phantom, uh, so that you don't get run over, and they ban it, you still just get run over. That's a bad feeling, right? There's no consistent, non-punishable way to deal with the character. Like Moon Bunny, for example. Like Moon Bunny is very safe and punishes Conqueror. We don't have a character that's functionally equivalent to that for C Phantom Paladus, except for one, which I will show you uh, after that. This it is actually this character, Shuna. This was my most reliable answer to Sea Phantom Paladus the entire season, and is why I wasn't really banning Sea Phantom Paladus until the last 24 hours when everybody was trying to just leave it unbanned and abuse it, right? So how it works, right, is you have Soul Consolation, right, that gives you the combat readiness push, and you are fast enough that if they press a button with high enough uh, F res here, right, like I have, uh, what is this like? 240-ish or so, 240 ER, 237. So I have enough ER here where unless they soul burn it, they're not gonna tag me. Not with a 300 speed C Paladus, right? It's not happening. So what ends up happening is I overtake them because of Soul Constellation. My Shuna goes second. Um, I press S3 with Sleeping Spell and I just put you to sleep and that's it. Uh, and I got a lot of people with this. I know I played against Lakari a couple of times, and I got him with this every time. Uh, a couple of people started to get wise to this. Like, this was like a free win. Everybody was like, who the hell plays Shuna? Shuna's so, like, nine months ago. What are you doing? I got so many people with that sleep spell uh, that it was kind of ridiculous. Until people started to realize, oh, Shuna is really good. Like, I would run into people who were like, you know, I would run into the same people all the time because we're at the top of the ladder. You're going to run into the same people. They see the Shuna, they pick the Dragon King Shuna. Because now if I try and sleep them, I actually just battery them and I let them kill me even faster. Uh, in which case, then you kind of have to default to Blooming Lotus and just cleanse the speed buffs and go about your day. But that leaves you susceptible to things like uh, Dragon King Shuruun's defense break, uh, Ambitious Tywin stuns. So it's not a perfect answer. This is what we just talked about with Paladis, right? Shuna only works... When people don't know Shuna is the answer, right? The second people are aware Shuna is the answer, that's when you're in trouble. And by releasing this video, I am now further propagating the Shuna tech, which means more people will use it, which means more Phantom Paladus players will be aware of it, which means that they just won't let it happen. So less counterplay, the character is still just broken. Got it? Good. The girl Luna with 50-50 crit chance right always got to have the girl strapped she is super uh lovely we love her she's the best uh, unfortunately she's also the worst she's not good but i liked playing her this season on stream for you guys i know how much everybody loves luna uh i think i was like three and one on the season with luna yeah uh, the most important collab unit in the entire game uh, that comes from a collab that will probably never, ever come back because, well, reasons. Uh, with Equipped with probably the most important knight artifact in the game that's not Elbrus or Arius um, and probably is also never coming back. Smilegate, please, you need to figure out a solution. Your player base will dwindle if you cannot find a way to produce a carbon copy of Icarina for your players. This is like a staple character. If you can't operate at 300 plus speed with multiple units, you have to have this character. And even then, I would argue you still have to have this character. She is the best anti-aggression character in the whole game. She has been the MVP in one of my seasons and very close to the MVP in every other season. This season is no exception. She's super good against Joshua, you know, Genoa, right? 
She's still a staple versus Cleave. She's good into ML Landy because you can just death break and pick her off. There's a lot of matchups where Karina is great in. And I just don't know how you're supposed to play Epic 7 without her. I just don't. So, Smilegate, you know, whoever's watching this gimmick, if you are watching this, it needs to be said. I, I bears repetition. I'll keep saying as many times as I have to. We need either an Espa collab rerun or you need to come out with a carbon copy character with the same kit and same artifact and treat those characters as Icarina and Rocket Punch Gauntlet. Essentially reskinning the same character and giving it again. Because without this character being available, players just don't get to play the game. And now what I don't want is for you to power creep this character and come up with a better version of it. Because that seems to be the, the way that, that we do this. Is if we need a solution, we just make a better version of it. That would be also toxic, right? I think this character is fair. I know a lot of people will say this character is toxic, BS, broken. I don't. I think this character is fair in the sense that the more unfair your opponent is, the better Karina is, right? But if you tried to make an unfair version of this character, then I think we would have a lot of problems. Elvira. Um, so a little bit of effect this, so that, that way I can land the death break and strip at the start to kind of help me out. Uh, I lowered my ER a little bit. I used to be about 300. I am currently 251. That's been enough. I almost never get tagged outside of Soulburn scenarios. And enough bulks so that that way they don't kill me off rip with a decent amount of speed so I can actually get immortality up in a timely fashion. Uh, Elvira is honestly my favorite unit to come out of episode 5 story-wise. I think she's super interesting. I think that her character design is amazing. And I love the fact that she is voiced by Lightning from Final Fantasy XIII. I love everything about this character, except her damage. Her damage numbers are atrociously bad. And as such, there are a lot of spots where Elvira is actually not a character. You need to be very smart about when you deploy Elvira, because if you deploy her when you have a low damage team, then you could still just get run over. They kill everything around Elvira and then you lose. So you actually have to have a high impact, powerful team behind Elvira to use her. The other use for her that's really good, though, is taking her fifth pick against Cleave when they have Commander Pommel. Because he is a fighting spirit based character, He get his fighting spirit is what lets him use his S2 to push up. So if you have Elvira on the team, Commander Pommel doesn't actually ever use his S2 gun, and he actually therefore can never get a turn, and therefore can never kill anybody. So it, it, they have to ban Elvira. Like if you have Karina and Elvira, and Karina wins you the game, but their win condition is Commander Pavel, and you have Elvira, they can't win the game. So they have to ban Elvira and give you Karina, which is super, super good. So yeah, this character, absolutely worth it. One of the better designed units to come out in a very, very long time. Uh, big thumbs up to Elvira. DJ Bibbles. Bibbles. We love Bibbles. Um, Shoutouts to Crest, uh, my bestie. Uh, he was saying that he thought Bibbles was very good before her hot fixes back in December. And after she got the hot fixes, he was convinced that this character was giga OP and meta. And that she was the absolute destruction of Navy Captain Landy. Like this character would house Navy Captain Landy. And he didn't understand why she wasn't a slam dunk pick every game against Landy because he was confident this character hosed her. And this was back in December, right? And I was like, you might be onto something. And I was playing her, but not that frequently, right? Because the thing is, you know, I wasn't confident in my Biblis build. Because you see, it's some purple pieces. It's nothing, like, crazy, right? But the more I played with it, the more I was like, I think this character is, like, really good. And then somewhere along the line this season, like a month ago, people realized Biblis is broken against Navy Captain Landy. And if you have Biblis, then they, and they have Landy, you can't actually, like, the Landy player can almost never win the game. They need to basically counterpick the Biblis or ban it. And that gives her, obviously, immense value because Landy's just broken, right? So, I think that this character, for a limited, was very, very good. The, this character is only good in one or two slots. But in the slot she's good in, she's essentially Rowana. And we all know how Rowana is, right? When Rowana's good, she feels like the most broken character in Epic 7. The same thing is true with Biblis. In matches against a martial artist, Ken, 
or in matches against Navy Captain Landy, this character is a force ban or you're just going to make it so that they can't play the game. You'll just out sustain them. They'll always be death broken. They'll always be blind. And therefore, they just can't deal damage and their characters just roll over and die from like a love tap. Characters great. Absolutely amazing in this meta. Oh, we forgot to put our artifact on after Guild Wars yesterday because I tried to copy uh, a team from a guildmate of mine. But yeah, here we go. Here's Arya. Um, uh, I used Arya actually a fair amount this season. My defense is lower than where I would like it to be, but uh, I am accounting for the, the fact that maybe one day I'll get imprints to bring me up there. I just wanted to have uh, a decent chunk of F uh, good crit damage and then a uh, decent amount of health because a lot of people a lot of you guys you send me your arias and they always come back with like 12k hp i don't like playing aria with that low of hp right honestly i probably should drop my damage to like 220 and bring this number up to like from like 124 i need to bring this up to like 140 150 if i'm being real with you um but overall Aria is very good when you let Genua through because there are a lot of games where like you'll have Karina Aria and they have Genua as their only real source of damage um, or they have like Abyssal, right? Like I I've had drafts where I've had like Alvira, Karina, Aria, Albedo and then like they have like Abyssal Genua as their team like DPS and it's just it's the worst feeling in the world. One of my last games of the season like I think my second or third to last game of the season was against Tristan Wolf. Um... And he let the Aria through and the Aria just ran him over because that was exactly his DPS. He basically just had uh, Abyssal plus Genoa. And it was just like, yeah, um, we don't, you don't get to play this game. So this is like the best Aria has been. It's largely because of the, uh, the EE here, right? Uh, I'm using the S1 one. I've seen a lot of people use the one that gives an extra focus. If you're playing her on book or you accompany her with a book, both are valid. I just don't think you play the S2 one. That's the only one I think you just don't go for. The one that's like uh, extra damage on the murder penguin. But yeah, Arya, this is the best I think she's been in like a year. She's very, very good right now. A staple unit for almost anybody that plays turn two is Elena here. Elena is probably the best soul weaver in the game right now versus Cleave. Taking, like if they, if the common pre-bans are Landy plus Bellion right for cleavers and that's a dead giveaway if you have first pick in that slot you insta slam zeo so that, that way you have a speed contester and you take away a book from them and it might force them to pivot out which is good for you if you don't want to play against cleave if you are second pick and they take zeo you immediately respond with arius knight plus abyssal because that's a character that is a hard ceiling on the game that they must deal with right and it can potentially ruin their day depending on whether you're on elbrus or holy sack now the reason why you go with those two is because if they go Politis in like the 2-3 and you're on Karina, then your Elena impact is super diminished because essentially, you know, they, they get to, they proc Elena uh, or like they proc uh, Karina first and then they get to punish it with uh, Politis and then Elena uses her passive and then she gets to punish the Elena with the Politis S3. So you don't want to have that happen. You don't want them to take Politus in the 2-3, right? So that's why you need to pick Karina later in the draft in the 4-5 slot. Elena is the perfect 3 in a lot of scenarios because she's good against Ran. She's good against Ludwig. Uh, she's good against Pavel. She's good against a lot of things. You just can't draft her earlier than 3 because you don't want to see red Politus because like that puts you in situations where you can't go Karina, which is obviously the best anti-cleave character, right? So like it lets you play the... the by picking Elena on 3... And waiting to see the red Politus, you can respond by going like Edward Elric, like we talked about earlier, instead of Karina. And that's super, super good. Uh, I just think that this character is super important, I think. You just want to get as much ER as you're, you can afford. At least 200. Uh, ideally, 230. 250, 260 would be really good if you could get it. Um, and then just over 230 speed with some bulk. right? You don't need as much bulk as me. It's just at least 230 speed. At least a bunch of high ER, you're good. Uh, as for the EE, I use the extra 5% because this lets me cut and potentially win games. Uh, a lot of people I know play the 2 debuff Dispel on the S3. It is your choice. A lot of people have more success with the other one. I might consider switching to it in the future. So I'm letting you know. My artifact is Exif Detective Gadget, 
right? I think that this is the best artifact versus Cleave. Uh, otherwise, Doctor's Bag is a good alternative. Doctor's Bag is if you want to use Elena for more generic use, like if you like playing against like maybe Abyssal or like Landy or something. I only really play this character versus Cleave, which is why I like Exif Detective Gadget, because it messes with the map, right? If they uh, AoE me, right, and they proc my S2 on Elena, not only am I going to heal up a lot of the damage, and it's going to put me in a position to S3 and basically shut them out of the game, but depending on what they do, they might go, oh, I have 40 souls. I will soul burn my Ran to defense break you. Ha ha. Now it's my Ludwig's turn. And then they realize that Ludwig only has 10 souls and they have to press S3. They can't press anything else. And if he doesn't soul burn, then even though you're death broken, you're not really in any danger of dying. Like you might go to like 30, 40% on everybody, but you're not dying. Um, and that's why I like playing this because unless they're on a 60 soul build um, where they have three mages, this thing really messes with them. Uh, Alencia. Now, Alencia might seem like a weird choice to talk about here in this video. But uh, I like Alencia in what I call the uh, the anti-Laya comps, right? Where if your opponent has no damage other than Laya, and that's it. Like, they're trying to play, like, two Soul Weavers plus, like, Carmen plus Laya. There are certain characters that are incredibly advantageous in those matches, right? Uh, we'll talk more about them in the dark section, but Alencia is one of those, right? If, you, if they are trying to just win the game with Laya... You can't just go ML Rat. Like, they ban DDR. They're going to ban ML Rat. So, if you have Alencia uh, or another one of these characters as your other DPS, then you have skin in the game and you could just injure Laya to a point where she can't do anything. That's the only matchup I play Alencia in. She is irrelevant in every other matchup except for when your opponent has Laya and they're just trying to rely on Laya S3 to win the game. Speaking of Laya, uh, this character is broken. Like, one of the most OP, stupidest design characters I've seen in ages. This character is so stupid, right? Honestly, I probably should lower my speed to get more HP. Um, the best ones that I've seen on ladder are like 260 speed with like 30 to 31k HP. You see here, I am just shy of 25k HP at almost 270 speed. So, I, mine isn't even that insane comparatively and i only have i still have free to play already i don't even have this at uh at max yet right i'll eventually get this there i'll eventually slate this character up um laia is a huge design mistake we needed a nerf to lua or an answer to lua which was good but the thing about laia is that if laia was just this and this s2 right the s1 and the s2 she would still be a playable character this the spirit of rock is actually the, the most egregious thing on this character. Who thought it was a good idea to give make Hand Guy, but faster and with Dark Corvus as all? Like, she has completely replaced Hand Guy, and she is just borderline oppressive. Like, if you don't have ML Rat, and, you, and they pre-ban DDR, right? Even if you had DDR. Bro, what are you supposed to do? Like, you, your only choice is Cleave. And if you're not fast like me, you don't you don't have, like, great answers. Which is why I kept Alencia geared. Because it's one of the only, like, good injury units. Like, it's like Edward, Alencia. And then there are two other solutions we'll talk about when we get to the dark uh, units. But overall, this character's just overpowered. She's just... She was my most played unit on the season. I think I had, like, a 60% win rate with her. She's just broken. Just broken, 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 broken. Uh, Rimuru. Uh, this is still like my same Rimuru that I always play. Just damage, Merciless, Glutton, Rimuru. Honestly, I think now the really tanky Rimuru that doesn't have damage with like ER is the best version of Rimuru. I just didn't have enough gear laying around to swap to that build. But I think that is the best version of it. Uh, Rimuru is very, very important because he checks uh, specific characters in the format. Um, specifically, like Galilius is the most obvious one. Uh, but he's really good against, like, even Navy Captain Landy. If you're on, like, a damage build, he puts a huge amount of uh, work in that spot. Uh, I just think you really need him. A lot of the Japanese players on ladder that are in Emperor and Legend first pick Rimuru because of how strong the tanky ER one is. He's flexible enough to be played into most things. Like, he's very hard to kill. Like, the things that kill him, you think about what kills a really high health ER Rimuru, and it's like, well, Gala. Gala could potentially do it. But the thing is, 
at the same time, he also kills Gala. So it's just like, the things that check him on that high health build are the things that like he's already good into anyway. So he's just really good. I still think that Rimuru is one of the most fantastically designed units in all of Epic 7. He truly embodies the character in the, the, uh, the Tensura series. He's exactly as you'd expect him to be. He's really overpowered and very resilient, but not too overpowered where it's not like fun, unfun. Like he's just a very well-rounded character in a lot of scenarios. Like I don't ever feel upset to see Rimuru on the opponent, the opponent's team because I know that, like Karina, it's a character designed to check overpowered things, and that's why I really love this character. Like this might actually be one of my favorite characters in the entire game. Like probably top top three in terms of characters I love playing. It might be Rimuru might be in my top. Uh, Zahak. Uh, Zahak is only here, largely, I play him in Nightmare Raid, but, like, once or twice, like, I was like, I have the speed advantage, I could just kill the op. My last piece is, unfortunately, de-geared, because that gear went to Shaltir for the collab to farm it. It's probably going back to LPK, because of the rework, right? But, yeah, that's it. It's just, Zahak is just here for odd when I have the speed advantage. No other reason. All right, here we go. My season MVP, which I know is going to sound absolutely absurd after how bad I bombed with this character in my propaganda videos, right? So I know what you're thinking. Why, oh why, is Albedo the season MVP? Well, look at the artifact. <laughs> Turns out, when you have better security state in Aegis Unfold, and you have Arius as your artifact on that character she becomes the shield she becomes the wall she is the immovable object it, like i talked about in my albedo video saying that she's better than people think right i talked about how this character lets you survive genoa and lets you survive gala and those characters when they hit my albedo they do like 60 percent of her health right which is a lot right but other tanks would die in one hit she stands her ground and survives with like 40 percent health and in some cases i get a cool counter back which is nice by the way builds counter protection don't play anything else on this character i think it's got to be one of those two but if you have her like that right with this level of mitigation those are the hyper carry dps's that i talked about that do explosive damage and they do like 50 to 60% of Albedo's health. Now, imagine what would happen if your opponent is playing just like standard average DPS. They do nothing. It's like literally like, you know, like like flies to her. Like it's just like, like pellets bouncing off of her. It doesn't even like hurt her. She just sits there and just goes, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm beautiful, I know. And she just doesn't die. And the thing is, her S3 is exactly what I said it would be. It's like an Arwell S3 where you strip all of their buffs, but instead of a stun, you get a defense break and an unbuffable. And when you think about the characters in the meta, right? How impactful that is. So Landy with defense break and unbuffable means that she's super easy to kill and she can't have attack buff, which means that she poses no threat to Albedo and her mitigation, right? Unless she has boat. Without boat, she doesn't pose any threat to you, right? Oh, a lot of people were playing Elbrus Euphine, right? Well, the second you see Elbrus, you just Rage of Nazarek them, unbuffable and break them, and then just one-tap them. Because at that point, they are death broken, so they do no damage again because they're a defense scaler, and then you just kill them. Uh, even Genoa. Yes, he's a fire unit, so it's a 50-50 chance, but if you death break an unbuffable Genoa with this character on Arya, so there's no like 3F proc, you just tap him, and he's gone. Like, we're, we're, we're done. Like, that's it. It's over. Um, Karina, same thing. Death break it. It's over. Just start thinking about, outside of Auden, start thinking about the damage dealers that are commonly played in the format, right? ML Rat, without unbuffable, she doesn't do anything. So your tank is literally the best mitigation source in the game and sets up your kills. Playing her on 3F is still very good, right? I'm not going to sit here and tell you it's not good because I had a lot of success with it, but... On Arius, this character feels next level busted. Like, you can't kill this character. 
she was probably my most drafted tank at the end of the season. Like you just you can't kill her. And I I, I I'm not gonna do it here, but I know like Valky and a bunch of other content creators are just gonna unload on people for saying this character sucks and needs a buff. Because, you know, I tried to tell you all. I told you so. And I'm here to tell you once again. I told you so. She is that good. And no, I'm going to say it for the record now. I thought before she was mid, it might need some tweak to the S2. I'm here to tell you, on Arius, at least to me, this character's nuts and doesn't need anything. Armin. My uh, favorite anti-cleave unit to play. And yes, I got to play her a lot more this season. Uh, a lot of you people wanted to see her on stream. And uh, yeah, uh, I, I kicked ass with her. She's great. I like her. Honestly, I like all the Armands. Like, I'm not like a fan of the character's design, but uh, I like that Crimson Armand lets me play the game. I like how funny it is to watch characters explode from Green Armand, and I just think Bad Cat Armand is the funniest character ever. So yeah, uh... The Armands are good. We like the Armands. Uh, she does big damage because she's got 3k defense and almost 300 crit damage. Um, this has been the same build for a year. A year and a half now. If you're a new player watching this, right? And you're struggling versus Klee. This is a great budget 4 star character. That you should consider picking up. You could, should consider making an Armin. She's very, very good. It's not just for the fact that her Albus Ritual Sword counters do big damage. It is also because... Protect here. Her S2 uh, passive. It decreases damage suffered by a single target attack on anyone on your team, right? By 20%. Which means that they can't kill you with things like Green Sid. Or even Jacko, you might actually survive. So if you're you're dying to those kinds of things, get yourself an Armin. She's great. Senya. We love Senya. Um, I hate the fact that the skin is now associated with a cheater. But, uh, y'all know how much I hate base Senya's attire because it's just, uh, not very ladylike. It's not very, uh, it, it defies physics, right? And I don't like that. Uh, but yeah, we love Senya. We heckin' love Senya. We still play Senya even in this meta. My, uh, HP is lower than it has been in the past. Uh, my attack is higher than it has been in the past. And that's because I had to kind of steal a piece from Senya. She used to have like 17k HP, but only like 4,700 attack. But I had to steal an HPP somewhere for someone. But at least she's still usable. Um, I use this character in spots where my opponent went very greedily with their draft. Where they have like Odin and like a couple other characters, right? Like So they have like maybe Odin and other characters that just don't have um, any way to deal with it. Like land, if they go like Landy, Odin, uh, a non-stripping tank, and then like another DPS. I can just slam Senya and I know when I if I get to that S3... No one's stripping it, and I'm just winning. I'm just controlling the pace of the game from there. So, we still like Senya. Uh, again, 4,500 attack with, like, 17.5k HP, 17k HP is probably a better build than what I'm playing. But, uh, yeah, this is my Senya. Uh, I wish she was a little bit tankier. Need to replace a piece of gear. I think it's the body. Like, nah, one of these pieces has it. That's yeah, this one. It's this helmet. This is the helmet that needs to get changed. Um, so yeah, this, this, this helmet, we'll find a different one in the off season. Uh, but yeah, we've always loved Senya. She's a really, really great character. Uh, Christy. I only play Christy in certain scenarios where, uh, my opponent is really trying to get to a specific character and shut it down with control. Like I'm well aware of it. I'm keenly aware of it. Like, um, uh, you know, maybe like I just need, I know I win the game as long as like ML Ken doesn't get stunned, right? So I just have this character with ML Ken. That's pretty much the only time I'm ever picking Christy. I'm not really picking her in any other scenario. It's just I, I know that I have I picked two DPS that hard check auto win the game. And I can just take Christy and know that there's nothing they can do to interfere with that and just pick up the free dub. Uh, Celine. Uh, I didn't really play Celine that much. Uh, only against Blue Flan players. That's the only time I really played her this season. I expect going forward into the next season that this character will be incredible. And you already know, I love my sword girls. I love Corinne. I love Celine. I love Sermian. So, of course, I'm going to try and give uh, our girl here some of the best gear on my account when it, uh, we finally figure out, like, what's the best way to use her after her changes. Uh, Lilius. 
Even I still played this. This was my MVP from last season. She ran everybody over, as you recall. I still use her from time to time. Uh, her damage is not quite where I want it to be. I'm actually going to... Uh, I'm in the process of making a new helmet and a new necklace for her with my event. Um, so that way I'll bring her up to a 4k attack. And believe it or not, actually, uh, my necklace only has two speed on it. So uh, when I get the necklace that is uh, the combination of the extra attack on the helmet and the extra the like similar attack score on the necklace should allow me to get to 4k attack, 270 speed with like 309 to 310 crit damage. Uh, this character is still really stupid. She kills basically every tank in the game in one hit outside of Albedo and Crimson Armin. She single-handedly is making it so that turn two just doesn't have great options. She is kind of gatekeeping the slow play style. And for that reason, I kind of hate her because she has... I do think tank busters should exist, but we already had them. They were called Straze and Lycan. You didn't need to make a very difficult to kill very fast character with great turn cycling that can literally kill most of the characters in the game in one to two hits that's really bad for game design and has pushed us in a situation that we're in now right she's one of the the major contributing factors to why the meta is fast landy um i always have a landy geared same thing as before um you know it's kind of like mid speed actually i should say like before i was like 220 or 260 this is in the middle of that 240 um the main place I take this Landy is in spots where my opponent has taken like, um, like Rowana and uh, or like Hangai, and they've taken like Silver, uh, Silver Tide Christy, right? Like if they're trying to go for like the the ML Ken Christy draft that I talked about, right? Where they're just trying to hunker down. You can't debuff my character. It's just buffed to high hell. That's when I'm taking Landy because she just excels in those scenarios. She's got an uncounterable S3 that they can't deal with. And their buff stacking and their slow playstyle gives me so much cycling. And allows me to just burn the entire team to the ground around the, the carry in the back. And once everyone's dead, then I can just pick up the free dub. Destina made a small resurgence for me this season. Because um, a lot of people were just using Laia as their only real way to kill somebody. And so if I have two hyper carries that can wipe the enemy team... Uh, and then I have Destina. If they ban one out, they have to focus Destina. And if they don't, then like I just revive and then just kill them anyway with like boat. Right? That's kind of how it works. So that's what I've been using her in. Uh, her ER is a little bit lower than it was before. Uh, just overall, her stats I think are a little bit less than where I used to have them. She's still not like she's not amazing anymore, right? She used to be the best soul weaver in the game. I would put her as like maybe like the fifth best soul weaver right now. She still has a place versus cleave. Uh, and she has a place versus these, like, really annoying comps where people are just trying to win off the back of Laia and nothing else. Ocean Breeze Lulica. Switch my imprint so you can see what my ER looks like. Uh, yeah, so I have some effectiveness. I would like to get a little bit more, like, 70 would be cool. Um, overall, like, I don't think my Lulica is, like, amazing. Uh, and I, I wasn't really trying to make her amazing. I took some gear away from her because I knew that it, as great as Ocean Breeze was... The fact that Sea Phantom Politis was in the format, I wasn't going to get a lot of mileage out of her. Uh, still worth it if, like, Phantom Politis is banned. Still great in response to, like, a Conqueror pick. Uh, pretty decent in, in uh, response to Laia. Not amazing in the Laia, but still, like, decent. Just overall, still rock-solid Soul Weaver. Very frustrating to play against, by the way, I might add. Like, I don't think she's, like, broken or anything. But, man, like, the, the number of games were, like... If only the enemy Ocean Breeze wasn't there, I could have won. Is more often than you, you think. So the character's very good. Uh, Rowana, just staple counterpick Soul Weaver. You guys already know Vigilant Eye is broken. Very good into Biblis. Good into Landy. Good into Lone Crest and Bologna. Uh, there's a lot of scenarios where this character is just OP OP. I don't think I have to explain why Rowana is OP OP. Uh, gear doesn't matter on this character. It's just, as I always say, as thick as she appears. Just, just both. If you want ER, you can get it. Just Stella Harpa, thick as possible. Hey, look, it's Conqueror Lilia. She's on worse gear than in the past. You'll notice that I have far less bulk than I did in the past, right? I'm at 19.6 now with 1477. Uh, that's because, one, I ditched Proof of Valor because I kept having these conflicts where I was drafting Conqueror alongside of my Proof of Valor shoe. Uh, and that made it so that one of them was like way susceptible to dying. So that had to change. Right. 
Uh, and then C Phantom Paul just ended up getting all of my old Conqueror gear because I think she's more overpowered than Conqueror. So in the spots where I could take her, I wanted her to be the one with the better gear. Um, but yeah, again, I've been playing for nearly two years now a 290 speed Conqueror and getting Emperor. So maybe you don't need 300 or 310 like you see your favorite streamer to actually start winning games and climb to champion. Maybe possibly even Emperor one day. That's just what it is. Like, she's the, the bedrock of my account. I play her early. I play her often. I, I like her. I don't like her character, like, in-game. I think she's kind of, let's be honest, a bitch. But I think that she's uh, a cool-looking character that's very satisfying to play. Uh, and very flexible. Gives you a lot of uh, a lot of options in scenarios. She's she's like a Swiss Army man. Uh, G Perg didn't really play him that much. He's just for Zeo trapping. That's pretty much it. Uh... Sepulchrum to obviously mit damage uh, and then extra CR, right? This is like a bruiser cheaper. The girl! She hasn't changed really at all since last uh, last video, but uh, people said this character was dead, right? Well, I started pre banning C Phantom Politis, and a lot of people started first picking like Laia and Landy. And surprisingly, um, the fourth pick, Lionheart Sermio, kept making it through, and with my damage. I just ripped through everybody. I just killed everybody. I, I literally, like, in the last day, I climbed, like, 100 points with just Lionheart as my carry. Still my favorite character in the game. I love this character. Little Queen Charlotte. Um, With her changes this season, I decided to go for more bulk because now she has a crit chance imprint. Uh, I only picked her in situations where my opponent went, like, ML Ken, Lone Crest, and Bologna. And I went odd in little queen charlotte because at that point you can't stop me from having a nuke and obviously both of those characters the way i like my odd is like 450 gear score right with the way she's built and the damage of this character on hellcutter i'm killing one like you're not stopping me i will one tap them right especially if you have like nothing else scary on your team right like if your team is like moon bunny carmen and then, like, those two, like, I'll just ban the Carmen, and I'll just, like, run you over. Like, you just don't have any mitt. I could just one-tap you. So, Charlotte's definitely much improved this season. I don't think she's, uh, she's, like, insane, but she's, like, low tier two. Uh, but the Cleave versions of her, by the way, the ones that are, like, 250, 260 speed, with no bulk and all attack, I think those ones are great also. Uh, Ambitious Tyron, probably what the player base will tell you is the best tank this season. Um, because his uh, S2 here, Battle Command, it denies a lot of nonsense. Uh, and then obviously the the combo with C Phantom Paul this is just OP OP, just so broken, right? You just all oh, you just start enraged and you just get to flash and kill people. My Tywin is far slower than most other ones on the ladder. Most people are playing him 250, 260, so that, that way off of uh, Paladis, you immediately get to flash somebody for um, for big value. The thing is. I'm not a fast player and I need to tank down. So he inherited a lot of my best gear from other tanks because he was often the tank. It was between him and Albedo most of the time were the two tanks I was drafting a lot on ladder. And when he was like 26.8k HP like he was in the past, he was just dying uh, too often. So I needed to juice him up and get him around 30k so that, that way he can actually hang. And then of course we still want some effectiveness because... Um, his provoke, not only does it strip the souls from the enemy team, but it just can win you the game outright. Just like critical, unresistible provoke with him is just, it's just GG. It's so good. Uh, God Queen Bellion, same as last season. Still like playing her when she's uh, applicable, when I think she's really strong. Uh, a draft that I noticed a lot of people were doing was they were drafting, um, they were like pre-banning uh, Landy plus Abyssal. And they were first taking Zeo. And uh, in those scenarios, I was taking Bellion plus Last Rider Crowd because I knew right away, like, you're going to draft Ran. And they would still draft the Ran into it anyway. I'm like, cool. I, li I literally have the Soul Burn checked from the rip. Like, are you hard committing to banning my one? And that would let me pick up a lot of uh, free wins with this Bellion. Um, I still like having good bulk, good damage on her so that I, my counter kills you in, like, two counters. Like, it takes, like, two counters from this Bellion to just rip through my opponent's team, usually if they're cleave. So... We still like her. Uh, here's Bellion again, by the way. God Queen Bellion. Yes, this is a real build, even though it's missing two reforges. I don't have uh, enough gear. And yes, uh, she's zero Malagora, zero imprints. 
So if you're wondering what the logic is for this one, some cleave players don't ban Bellion, like the one that we just talked about, right? Uh, and they leave it open, and you could just take this early in the draft as your Arius Knight. And it's on protection set, so it gives you the longevity. She, you look at her, her health and defense. She's just a brick. She's not here for anything, to be a brick. It just gives protection set, barrier, immunity so you can't stun her unless you strip, and then Arius to damage her. That's it. She's just a brick. It's so funny how this became a build this season, when this was a build I theorized back when I did my first thoughts and initial impressions for Bellion. It's funny how we've come full circle, right? I originally am envisioned Bellion just being a brick that sits there with Arius that denies souls, and then it actually ended up becoming a reality. It's so funny that that actually is uh, the state of this character. This character might have some of the most flexible build paths in the whole game, um, because you could technically play her uh, counter, you could play her injury, you could play her protection set like this one, uh, you could play her 270, 280 speed with high effectiveness for Apocalypse. Like, she's gotten, she has four builds, and they're all very, very viable at various different degrees. Like, she's very flexible as a character. There's a reason why this is one of my favorite characters to play in the game. Because she's just, she feels satisfying to play, and she feels satisfying to theorycraft and brew with. I like characters like that. I, that's, I think that's, aside from Shackles of Suppression, getting rid of souls, right? I think everything about Bellion is wonderfully designed. Crimson Armin. So, uh, this character has more bulk, less speed than you're used to, and that's so that I can spend more time in her S3, Shield of the Holy Spirit. Um, Ace Trainer, let me know that the, the, if your Crimson Armin is between 130 and 140 speed, Trap Tricks also let me know this. If your Armin is in that speed range, the average Laia laps you twice while you're in Invincibility. So if you have, like, base speed, Navy Captain Landy, plus Crimson Armin, that stays in inv invincibility for a very long time. And they can't really get to it. And that allows you to pick up a bunch of fighting spirit on characters like Landy and then just dunk them. And they're like sitting there waiting to throw the guitar, waiting for you to come out of it. And it never actually happens. So, yeah. Uh, alongside of Albedo, this is a staple tank of the format. I think that, these, th that Crimson Armin and Albedo are the two best tanks in the game right now. Uh, with Ambitious Tywin also being in that conversation. I think they are the big three when it comes to tanks right now. Um, and that's because they just either they're the two best mitigation sources. Um, or they just have defense break in the case of Albedo and uh, and Ambitious Tywin. Like defense break is the most powerful debuff in the game right now. I think that if you can defense break, your team is really strong. It doesn't matter what you're doing. I don't care what your play style is. I don't care if you're aggro with Briar Witch. I don't care if you're slow with Albedo. I don't care if you're fast with Ram. Defense break is what wins games right now in 2024 of Epic 7. And so if you want to win games, get defense breakers. Last Rider Crow. Uh, he's a lot on a lot of hodgepodge gear. You'll notice that he's not on lifesteal this time. He doesn't have any ER. This is just all like leftover stuff I got laying around. I think it's like a bunch of stuff I borrowed from Tamarin. Uh, there are certain spots where I want him because he's still a, a carry from the tank position. But Gala and Janua and ML Shu and DDR, these characters being like, you can't ban all of those, right? Um, Hua Young also, right? Those characters, you can only ban two. A third if you count the post ban. There's five checks to this character that instantly kill him. So like, how are you supposed to play him with any regularity? So that's why I just don't like LRK right now. I think he's fallen off really hard. Uh, and that's not his own fault. He's still a fantastic character in terms of kit. It's just that the characters that are played right now don't let him actually enter the game. He never actually gets to enter the game. Navy Captain Landy, right? This character is broken. I don't think I have to explain it. She's currently up as I'm recording this on the video. She is up on the summon banner. If you don't have her, pull for her. Or at least wait until week three to see what Senya does. And if you don't like her, pull for Landy. Because this character is broken. She is not okay. KJ, again, to go back to his draft, pick Navy Captain Landy even in his cleave comps. This character is broken. And one of the most unfun, unenjoyable, terribly designed characters in the entire game. She borderline has ruined this game. And honestly, no matter the problem with her is she's so strong that if you try to make answers to her, 
like your Galilius, right? Uh, like your, your Behus or whatever. The, anything you can develop to check Navy Captain Landy super easily, it's not a surgical, like, precision strike. It's like dropping, like, a daisy cutter, like a nuke. It literally, the collateral damage is it destroys every other character in the game around it. Like I said, I feel like she's borderline ruined the game. And I don't know how they figure, they, again, unless they are willing to nerf characters, I don't know how you design your way out of this, this problem that they put themselves in. Oh, we skipped RL, my bad. We jumped ahead, mouse wheel problems. All right, so RL, uh, still one of the most reliable tanks in the game. Uh, I, I think she's all reliable. If you don't know what tank you want, I think Arwell's pretty good. I think Albedo has stolen her thunder because the main thing for me was I would always pick Arwell into Armin so I could death break, or not death break, but uh, I could strip people out of the invincibility. Like I could basically like peel them out of Crimson Armin's invincibility and then focus fire them while the rest of the team is invincible and pick up the dub that way. Albedo is a better Crimson Armin extractor than Arwell, because the thing is, not only do you rip them out of the invincibility, but you death break them and unbuffable them. And also, you could preemptively rip them out of the ROL situation, right? I've had things where it's like, Albedo goes first, um, or like she's going, and then I have, um, like, Lone Crescent Bologna is going to be the, my next character, but it goes Albedo, Crimson Armin, Lone Crescent Bologna, in that order. And I'm like, well, he's going to S3, with Crimson Armin. Well, no. What you end up doing is you just use Albedo. Just defense break the character. Crimson Armin goes to press S3. But it doesn't shield their DPS. And then you just S3 it with like Lone Crescent Bologna. And it just explodes. Right? So, Arwell's still very good. Because she is essentially adamant Arius. Like, I think we're at the point in the game where if you want to be a tank. You have to be adamant plus Arius. Or you have to do something so incredibly bonkers proactive like Tywin. Otherwise, like, it's not going to cut it anymore. That's why, like, Last Rider Crow fell off. Because he's the only one of the big three. When I talk about big three, I mean, like, big three mitigation knights. Arwell, Crimson Armin, Albedo. All three of these characters can hold Adamant and Arius at the same time, essentially. That's why they're the big three right now. And if you're, uh, with Tywin kind of being the, that other one. Like, right, Tywin's not a mitigation knight. He's just a proactive knight that can hold Arius. That's great. But, like, for premier mitigation, the big three is Arwell, Albedo, and then Armin. Triple A, basically. Albedo, Arwell, Armin. We'll call it Triple A. Save your Auden. This is my, like, 450 gear score, lifesteal, save your Auden. Uh, it's the same one as all the other videos. Uh, this is She's all reliable. She is actually surprisingly incredibly difficult to check right now in the meta. Like, um... Ludwig is the most consistent thing, and Briarwitch, they're the two most consistent answers I see to Auden. So she's terrible versus Cleave. Don't ever pick this character into Cleave. She's so bad outside of the five pick versus Cleave. I see so many people at lower ranks picking Auden versus Cleave. Please don't do that to yourself. You're going to die every time. Um, but in response, like if you have like Navy Captain Landy and Savior Auden together, it's a real strong combo. It's like peanut butter and jelly because the things that you want to beat uh, Navy Captain Landy. Save your odd and probably checks it. Like, it's just like Gala. But even then, Gala can die to random salvo. Right? If you just get lucky. But, like, you think about it. ML Chem dies to Aiden. Abyssal dies to Aiden. Lone Crescent dies to Aiden. Right? So, like, there she became, like, the PB and J, right? I would I would commonly take Landy first. And then, based on their draft, take either Lionheart or Odin in the 4-5 slot. Uh, and I think that's where she's best right now. Spirit Eye, largely only used for Guild Wars, but sometimes when their only damage dealer is Abyssal and they got no CC, Spirit Eye is a pretty good pick because you just press S3 and you win game because they can't kill her. Uh, here's my slow AOL uh, on Spirit's Breath. Uh, I think I, I I don't know why I put her on Spirit's Breath. I think it was for some, some specific reason. But uh, most likely, Book is probably the play. In fact, I'll just put Book on right now because Book is just super useful. I don't remember what my, my logic was for it. But, uh, yeah. There you go. It's my slow AOL. Just really high F so I can get to you. Uh, part of my 78 boots. I don't really play AOL a lot. I don't really like playing her because I, I just... There, there are spots, like, specific spots where I pick her on four because I know it checks them really hard. Like, I'm only ever picking her 
uh, in the four slot when I'm second pick. I don't think I ever pick her in any other scenario. I just don't feel confident picking her proactively in the three slot. Maybe in the four five if I'm going first pick. But otherwise, no. Not really. She's a very strong character. She's good into some cleaves. Uh, she's good at shutting some people down. Like, if they have, like, a bunch of silver bullets to check one character, you could just bring AOL in on, like, 4-5 um, and just have AOL lock down all their silver bullets so that, that way they can't get to, like... They have a bunch of things that are like, oh, I'm I'm trying to kill uh, your Lia. Uh, and you're just like, well, AOL checks Rat and everything else you got. I'll just AOL and keep you off of everything. So, that's where I use her. Architect Laika... Same as previous seasons, it's just, hey, I have the speed advantage, you're slow, here's my fifth pick, Laia, or Laika, if you don't ban it, I kill you. That's all it's there for. Um, I think we should have just left tank busters at this. Straza plus this was enough. Stra I think between DDR, Briar, Straza, Architect, Laika, we didn't need anything else. Even if you want to throw Hua Young in there and Arunka, you have enough tank busters, bro. You don't... We, we didn't need Gala, that's what I'm getting at. Uh, Sage, my Sage is on terrible gear, uh, but you, you gotta have him. Sometimes he's good in the, the cleave matchups. If they don't have Polidus, he's a decent last pick for span, right? Uh, ER just felt like a scam on him. I just kept getting hit by every Zeo, because every cleave Zeo is like 200 F, so like, who cares? It, the effective resistance doesn't matter. Even if I put 100 on him, it doesn't matter, bro. I just put enough effectiveness on him and a decent amount of speed and bulk with just what I had laying around. I mean, it, you can tell it's not premium because there's a 78 on it. You can tell it's not a premium piece of gear. It's a bunch of purples and a 78. Um, with his buffs, I think he'll be more consistent, but I don't think it's enough to save him. Uh, Solitaria. Uh, I had to move some stuff off of her. I forget what the reason was, but uh, she's not as good this season as she was in previous seasons. Definitely picked up some games from her. Definitely won some games, but also lost a lot of games with her. I'm a bit down on her because once I started looking at the match history and seeing that, like, I was only winning, like, 45% of my games with Solitaire, it started to make me realize, like, maybe she's not as good as I think she is. Like, she batteries Abyssal. She does nothing to land E, right? Um, your, fuel, your CR pushing odd in unless you're getting stuns or, uh, you know, uh, extra debuffs from, like, Daydream and stuff. It, just a lot of the common DPSs, like Lionheart, uh, Lone Crescent, like, you're just battering these characters, right? It's a... Uh, I'm just, like, kind of down on her. She's still strong when she's strong. Still oppressive when she's, you know, in that those uh, right spots. But otherwise, uh, eh, it's just, it is what it is. Sylvan Sage Vivian. So, uh, I only played this character twice the entire season. One with her both times. And it's the same exact reason that I talk about every single season. I only play her in to protect the Spectre 10 of Briarcon. Because when you have her start on book... And then you have her S3, right? There's nothing they could do. They could silence you, and you could still get to Spectre. In fact, that's all I usually do, is I just soul burn, get the speed buff, so I can come flying back around and soul burn and kill the Spectre. That's it. That's all I do with her. And then immunity, so that, that way, Spectre usually goes ahead of her, like, right before her. Like, Spectres are usually, like, 205 to 215, maybe 230. So they can't stun my Vivian. So then my Vivian just goes, soul burn, hit your Spectre, fly back around to the front because I have speed buff and then either press S3 if I need the health or soul burn again win the game. Ah, yes, Dragon King Sharoon. My, 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 like, one of my favorite units to play. Uh, I keep saying that this is my daughter because everyone hated on her and bullied her and said she was really bad and ugly and she's got, like, a weird hand and, and, and stuff like uh, people were making fun of her like all the time and I was just such a big believer of this character and it was about the time when I saw Elvage said that this character is actually snapped and Red messaged me and said holy hell Dragon King Shroon's a cleave character and I just think back to that iceberg that Dragon King Shroon iceberg where I said people think it's a DDR character it's actually a cleave character all right this character is just insane because she is anti-cleave she is cleave. She is uh, the way that I play her, a sustained mage, right? There's so much you can do with this character. This character is incredible. I would say right now in the current state of Epic 7, this is the best Soul Weaver in the game next to Death Dealer, right? I think her and Death Dealer, right, are the two best Soul Weavers, like not even close. She is just incredible in so many scenarios. I'm sorry if you skipped her because you thought she was boring. 
stupid looking, not very powerful, but yeah, she's that strong. Uh, Infinite Horizon of Cadiz. I primarily only really use this in certain like cleave comps when they don't have uh, Red Politis. Uh, or they're a very debuff heavy comp. They, uh, if I have like this plus Edward Elric, it's very difficult for them to control me, right? Because if I, I, I pick my timing right with here with the matter reconstruction, aka I call it the Tinder swipe because she like swipes to the, the left, right? Uh, it's very, very powerful. You can get some very ludicrous buffs and just win the game. Uh, I just have some ER on her. I have 245 after unfading memories, uh, good bulk. Speed actually doesn't need to be as fast as you think. Like 200 is enough, 190. Just focus on getting your other stats up. Uh, just let the S2 push you up. Let that do the rest, right? Uh, Moon Bunny, uh, not as much HP as uh, I probably would like. Like I use the imprint usually unless I need the attack buff. Bulk is very whatever. ER, I wanted to make sure I have over 200 so that people can't get me doctor's bag so I can cleanse out of things. Uh, just staple character that I think that everybody needs to have because it checks Conquer and a bunch of other nonsense. It checks DDR. Checks Nequal. That's probably the number one reason why you should build this character because she checks Nequal. If you have Moon Bunny plus Ambitious Tywin as your tank, Nequal is going to have such a bad time because all she can do is be a bad Lua in that case. And if she seals your Moon Bunny uh, to try to come back around and do it again, you just go Doctor's Bag and I get out of it. Right? So, Moon Bunny really important. Uh, Ruel of Light. Yes, I did play Ruel of Light this season. And she was pretty decent. Uh, again, similar scenario that we talked about with Destina. Sometimes they draft the, the Laya only DPS comp. And if you just have Ruel, right? Then, well, that's like really bad because they can't kill your Landy. Or whatever your threat is, right? So they're just like, damn, I can't just guitar and win the game. I got to go through Ruel. Well, my Ruel's on an Idol's Chair, so thanks for the free offense for trying to focus my Ruel and get her off the board first so you can guitar. Yeah, my favorite Soul Weaver in the game, even though she's bad still. Speaking of bad, uh, here's my really terrible Apocalypse Ravi. If Hezmana saw this, he would be ashamed. Which, by the way, shout outs to Hez. Has made it to Emperor rank this season. First picking Apocalypse Ravi every single game and maintaining over a 60% win rate. Honestly, this character was so bad because of DDR and so bad because of Rat. But the one thing I learned from watching Hez and his games is that if you first pick a Ravi, which I don't recommend you do, but having a Ravi on your team severely limits the abilities of Laya because. Laya has no hope of ever beating a Ravi. So if they are trying to play this like Ocean Breeze Lulica plus like AOL plus Crimson Armin plus Laya comp that everybody's like trying to play something like that. You can just pick a Ravi and just get one or two good axe swings into Laya. She'll be like 30, 40% injured and then she can't kill even the most mediocre a Ravis with guitar. And then you just go, okay, and eventually Laya will die. Like, if they try to play that comp, a Ravi just solos it for free. And when I realized that, I hastily cobbled together what you see on your screen, which is this terrible a Ravi that I have. And I'm like, all right, I, 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 I just, I'll just pick it into those spots, right? Like, if I have the 4-5 pick, I'll take a Ravi and another character that we'll talk about, and I just know I've won the game. Dark Corvus, uh, I feel like I'm missing a piece. Oh yeah, sorry, we didn't reforge this. That's what it is. I, I changed this necklace for something else, but like, it's just a Dark Corvus. Like, if this was actually an 85, right? Like, do I have the reforge? We just, no, we do not have the reforge, sadly. But yeah, like normally he's like 30K, 31K. I played him at 32K, 200 speed earlier, but I think I copped some of his gear for another character. It might've been Albedo. Um, but yeah, normally you just want 1500 defense, 30K plus HP. Uh, 100 ER. I have 130 because somebody, I, that's what it was. Um, somebody told me I should try 130 ER over 100 and it cost me bulk. So that's why it looks like this. I'm going to go back to 100 ER, 31 KHP, 200 speed like I had in the past. Uh, here's Dilibet. Right. Dilibet is, uh, is what it is, right? Uh, mine's kind of slow, but uh, she's good versus those control comps. Like they can't kill her. In the spots where she's good, you can't kill her because she just always uh, gets out of the debuffs. You can't control her.
Uh, and then obviously she's got the, the pseudo cleanse on the S3. Uh, honestly, this character, all she really needs, model disqualification, if this was uncounterable, this character would be nuts. That's like, I think the big thing she needs, model disqualification can't be countered. Uh, Inferno Kawazu, I don't think I played him really, like, hardly at all this season. Um, but it used to be for, like, the all AoE comps, where it's like, oh, my comp is, like, Landy and Lionheart. Um, but even then, I didn't really want to play him that much. Like, it's just your standard Inferno Kawazu. I largely just use him for Guild Wars. Lone Crest and Polona. Uh, this is my second season on the Destruction build. I like it a lot more than the Counter build. Uh, I think I need to be a little bit tankier, I'll be honest with you, because, like, I played against some Lone Crescents that were, like, 21, 22k HP. And even if it cost them damage, I don't think it matters. Um, they were just winning more games, I feel like, because I just couldn't kill Bologna. So, yeah. We'll, we'll see. If I could get some more Bologna's, like, Triple S to get more imprints, that would probably go a long way. Uh, I think this is one of the most important ML5s to have right now, because she's just good in a lot of scenarios. She's good versus Albedo. I should put that out there, right? Uh, because Albedo just batteries her so hard if they just never touch Albedo. So... Uh, that's one of the main reasons why I think you want to play her, because she's great into that character. Great into Landy. Pretty solid into Abyssal. Like, not amazing into Abyssal. Depending on what they have, it could backfire, but, uh, could be pretty good. Uh, just good into a lot of damage dealers, I feel like, in the format. Um, I've been playing her a lot this season. Uh, Martial Arts Ken. This is, uh, my, my, uh, my whatever Ken build, whatever you want to call it. My Kenoff build, if you will. Um... I just don't have another 30 Sigurds. It's on Bologna and I use her more often. Uh, he used to be really insane. He's kind of a victim of Laia. He's terrible on Delia. So if you have Laia, uh, then he's a lot better, right? Uh, like we talked about before, Christy. Like Christy Ken Laia is a pretty good shell. I feel like for a lot of drafts, if you you, you can go that route if they're playing like control heavy. Because uh, they just won't be able to kill Ken. Uh, wouldn't play him into Urban Shadow Shoe. We talked about that last season as well. Uh, if he gets injured too low, then you just don't get Sigurd Scythe and he just gets one tapped by uh, Rat Gun by the S3. So, yeah, he's not as good as he used to be, but he's still worth having. Uh, speaking of characters that aren't as good as they used to be, but not worth having, I moved a lot of gear off of Mediator, right? But uh, he is what he is, right? Honestly, uh, this Warhorn is probably going to get copped from him, and I'm probably going to move it over to Conqueror Lilius. Is what I'm thinking about doing in the future, because I draft Conqueror so much. And I didn't draft Mediator nearly as much. Now, I always felt that Mediator would be an evergreen character. And I still think he's great. I think he's amazing in the Ambitious Tywin, right? If your opponent is taking Ambitious Tywin, he is a snap pickup. I think he's so good into that matchup. Um, but overall, like, he's just not what he was. Because Laia is him, but faster. The same level of tankiness. Offers the same level of utility uh, in a lot of cases. And is also a win condition, right? So you have to choose. Do you want... An attack buff from Quark, or do you want a win condition? And a lot of people would rather have the win condition, especially because the win condition uh, is pretty good versus Nikwal and Lua, which Hangai is trash against. Urban Shadow Shoe. Uh, still on the same build from Urban Shadow Shoe. How to play Urban Shadow Shoe. Uh, no pen set, but that's just because I feel like having bulk and speed is more important than damage on this character. I talked about that in this video. Um, Probably a top five damage dealer, I feel like, for standard. Right? Like, if you're a standard player, uh, you need this to be able to check Laia. She's super important. Uh, th there's not much else to say. Just bzz, just does so much damage when you are fast. That's all there is to it. Great character. Uh, other great character, Abyssal. Um, I tried Elbrus for most of the season. Problem is, when you run into Auden, you are dead in the water. You are dead, dead, dead -o. Whereas, if you're on Holy Sack, uh, you don't care about the Auden matchup that much. Like, you could still win that pretty free. So that's why I decided to go with it, because I was losing a lot of matches to Auden. Once I switched back to Holy Sack, I wasn't losing as much, especially because I'm drafting Carmen and Albedo every game, or like Arwell, and I can just survive long enough from uh, one of my big three to, so to you know get to my enrage, my trauma, and then just win the game from there. Um, alongside Landy, she's like the other Cancer DPS in the format. Unlike Landy, though, I actually don't think that this character is that terribly designed. She's badly designed in the sense that I don't really think that the S3 should ignore ER. But, uh, otherwise, like, I'm fine with it, right? Like, I'm fine with the character. Like, I, I, I don't feel as upset when I lose to Euphine, right? When I lose to Euphine, it's like, oh, well, sucks to suck. But when I lose to Landy, it's like, dude, this game, like, I, are you, are you serious right now? Like, 
Landy makes me want to, like, break my desk, whereas Abyssal's like, oh, well, good try, go next. So, for me, I, I don't mind Aufine as much. Uh, Briar Witch. It's the same one for previous seasons. Immunity, so it's harder to debuff. Guiding Light. Highest level Guiding Light, so I get the bonus attack, as much attack as possible. Right? I guess we should put on the skin. I guess that's probably a thing that we should do, right? This is the season that it came out. So I guess we should look at the skin, right? Ah, it doesn't look that bad. Let me look at the expressions real fast. Oh, I like that one. I like the laugh. I think that's a good one. So, yeah. Um, just a, a really good tank breaker. Uh, good versus evasion units. Again, we talked about this. If you want to win games in, of Epic 7 in 2024, get yourself a defense breaker. Make sure your Briar Witch, by the way, I see this all the time in Fix It Fridays. You guys copy everything of mine, but the effectiveness. The effectiveness is important. I think it's more important than the damage. You need to get the death break. The death break is what's winning you those games. Uh, here's my crappy Sea Phantom Politis. She's on my gear that used to be on uh, Conqueror Lilius. Same speed, same effectiveness you're probably used to. Uh, Miscon file for the defense break because obviously she strips on the S1. And then if you get the defense break, I, I, I'm going to say it again. You want to win games with Epic 7 in 20. 24. Defense break. It's that important. Uh, yeah, character is super overpowered. Even somebody of my slow playstyle could take advantage of it. I started pre-banning her at the end of uh, the season because I was just tired of playing against her because, you know, there's not really too much counterplay to her. It's really, really annoying. The final dark character to talk about versus the I play Laia and no other damage is actually Ein Zulgon. And he drew probably seven or eight post bans but the one game one or two games where i actually got him through he did win me those games now that's not to say that i think Ainz doesn't need a buff because i still think he's terrible but what makes him good is there are scenarios where your opponent is again carmen laia ocean breeze luluka um and then like some other character like some other supporter right like maybe rowana or something to try to check your your uh your Navy Captain Landy, right? And then they pick, like, another damage though. You post-ban that damage though. If they give you, like, you go, like, a Robbie Aynes or, like, Alencia Aynes, that game is over. They can no longer win that game. So that's that's his value. That's his contribution to Epic 7. And that sucks because for, you know, Aynes summer, like, Lord Aynes, he should be way better than that. Spectre, it's my same Spectre from pretty much every video I've done in the last year. I almost never draft her. There are times where, like, I look at my opponent's draft, like, he's got no AoE. I just take uh, Nakwal plus Spectre. And it's just like, okay, well, Nakwal says you don't get to play the game. So your only choice is to play through Spectre. And since you can't get the Spectre, I have all the time in the world to kill you. That's where you play Spectre. I don't think first pick Spectre is good anymore. Uh, Zio. Uh, I really like taking Zio into Cleave if I have first pick because I'm full damage, so I could just easily rip through them. And, you know, my speed's a little low. Uh, most Zios have moved on to, like, 265, 270. So I'm actually on the slow end now for a Zio, but that's life. That's how it always is. He's still broken. He's probably, like, top five character still in the game. Maybe top ten. He's just super broken. Death Dealer Ray, another super broken character. Um, I didn't play him as much. This season, and that's because he stayed pre-banned for me for almost the entire season. So this is like the same build as last time. My effectiveness is kind of low. It probably should be like 180 instead of 143. But I didn't see a reason to re-gear him because I just got tired of playing against him. And, you know, he he's not a fair... He, like, I wouldn't say he's a fair character, but he's also like not unfair, right? He presses buttons. You know exactly what he's doing. There's no like RNG involved, but like... There's just lack of good answers to him. Like, Dragon King Sharoon. Even Dragon King Sharoon is not a reliable answer to him. Because depending on where she's at in the CR bar, her passive doesn't work until she takes a turn. So if she's like at the bottom of the CR bar, they're like, oh, now I can press S3, S2 and sleep your whole team. And as long as I kill Sharoon, like, right now, right here, right now, uh, before she gets to her next turn, uh, I basically just time walked you and got extra turns. I just got a whole extra cycle on all my other characters. And then you could freely pick up a W. Um, there's just no meaningful counterplay, I feel like, to this character outside of Sharoon. And even then, it's not great counterplay. This character is just stupid. Uh, this is another, like, reworking him, I think, was just a really bad decision. I just don't know what they were thinking. 
But yeah, that's it. That's everybody on my account that I played this season, or at least considered playing. Notice how most of my characters are limiteds and ML5s, right? That's what I said at the start. I think that they have a lot of work to do this summer to fix the state of Epic 7. Because uh, I think right now that uh, RTA is... It's getting better. But it has a lot of problems. And things like Sea Phantom Polis did not help. Alright. Thanks for watching. I recognize it's been like an hour and a half. Hopefully you enjoyed it. If you have any questions, let me know down in the comments below. Also, let me know how you finished this season. If you made it this far, let me know how did you do this season. Were you happy with your performance? What are you hoping for next season? Would love to hear any and all those things. As always... Enjoy the rest of your day, the rest of your week. I'll catch you in the next one. Bye-bye now.